Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 133, Russian Generals of the Napoleonic Era, Part 1. Last time, we reviewed the life and murder of Grigory Rasputin, and today we start a new series on Russian and Soviet generals throughout history. This series will likely not be continuous, but will appear here and there as I see fit. So we're going to cover some generals, then go on to a different topic, come back to them again. So it's going to be kind of a hit or miss type of series, and I hope you enjoy it. Today we're going to cover the lives of three men of six who were the leaders of the Russian army during the time of the 1812 invasion of Russia by Napoleon Bonaparte. The men are Pavel Chichikov, Peter Wittgenstein, and Alexander Tormasov. Next time we're going to be covering Peter Bagrachon, Michael Andreas Barclay de Tolly, and finally the headman Mikhail Kutuzov. Now in this episode, and the shorter of the two, we're going to discuss the careers of the first three men, and the next week we're going to cover the last three. First, let's start with a bit of background on what was going on when these men served their country in repulsing the French. The Tsar at the time, of course, was Alexander I, the son of the hugely unpopular Paul. Napoleon was marching through Europe and had his eyes on Russia. Now, the official reason Napoleon used to invade was to liberate Poland, but the real reason was his goal of stopping Russian trade with England. He believed that if he reached Moscow, Alexander would sue for peace, which would allow the French to concentrate on the British and end the Peninsular War in Spain and Portugal. Now, the first military leader I will cover is Pavel Vasilievich Chichikov the son of Admiral Vasily Chichikov and an Englishwoman. Born on July 8, 1767, Chichikov spent m most of his early years in England with his parents. He studied in the Russian Naval Corps before joining the army in 1779 as a sergeant at the tender age of 12 in the lifeguard Preobrazhensky Regiment. Now, this was not unusual for young men to start their careers as early as 10, so being 12 and going away, very normal at this time in Russia. He joined the 1st Marine Battalion in 1782 and served in the Mediterranean in 1782 through 1784, acting as an aide-de-camp to his father. In the Russo-Swedish War of 1788-90, to Chichikov commanded the ship the Rostislav, and because of his brilliance, he was awarded the Order of St. George, 4th degree. After the war, he went back to the Royal Naval Academy in Portsmouth, England, where he met Elizabeth Proby, whose father was a commissioner at the Chatham Dockyard. He returned to Russia in 1796 and asked permission from Emperor Paul I to marry his fiancée. The Tsar refused, saying, quote, There are sufficient brides in Russia. There is no need to look for one in England. Chichikov lost his temper and supposedly physically attacked Paul, who had him thrown into prison. But as the erratic emperor was wont to do, he pardoned Pavel and allowed him to marry Elizabeth and promoted him to rear admiral. Now, after Paul was murdered, his son Alexander had Chichikov promoted to vice admiral and by 1807 made him a full admiral and minister of the navy. Still, he was not a happy man, and he resigned his post to travel with, with his wife throughout Europe between about 1809 to 1811, which is sort of odd because, you know, Europe was in a you know, state of war, but he still was able to do that. Tragedy struck the couple, though, with the death of Elizabeth in 1811. When Alexander recalled him in 1812 to become the commander-in-chief of the Army of the Danube in the Russo-Turkish War, well... That wasn't good timing because by the time he made it there, they uh, signed the 1812 Treaty of Bucharest, which signed and signaled the end of hostilities. By now, Bagrachon and Kutuzov led their respective forces against Napoleon at the Battle of Borodino on September 7th. And I'll go more into that later in the next week's uh, podcast. Well, Napoleon took control of a burnt-out Moscow. Uh, the French were absolutely stunned that the Russians would actually destroy their ancient capital, and their scorched earth tactics were also very surprising to Napoleon and the French. They, they couldn't imagine 
that they would destroy their cities, destroy their fields, let their people starve in order to defeat Napoleon. He, he was just, he had not figured on this. Well, Chichikov was then sent to the south of the Pripet marshes to take over the army there to threaten Napoleon's flank, which caused the French to retreat into Smolensk on October 19th. Then the biggest disappointment of his career would occur. Napoleon needed to get out of Russia as quickly as possible with his troops because they were suffering greatly due to the bitter cold and lack of supplies. On November 26th through the 28th, the French army began to cross the Berezina River, despite being boxed in by forces of Chichikov, Wittgenstein, and Kutuzov. Pavel tried repeatedly to stop the retreat, but despite having four times as many men, about 40,000, French marshals Oudinot and Ney were able to get their men across. Chichikov was then accused of letting the French cross, and by 1813 he was dismissed in disgrace. He left Russia and headed to France, and later became, and this I found a little odd, he became a citizen of the United Kingdom, although he almost never visited there, and he, but he never would return to Russia again. For the rest of his life, he lived predominantly in France and Italy, dying in 1849 in Paris. Now, the second field marshal we will follow is Peter Kristianovich Wittgenstein, the son of an aristocratic family of Prussian origin. He was born on January 17, 1769, to Count Christian Louis Casimir and Countess Amelia Ludovica Fink von Finkenstein. At the age of 12, he enlisted as a sergeant in the lifeguard Semyonovsky Regiment. He fought with honor during the Russo-Polish War in 1794, 1794 excuse me, especially during the Kosciuszko Uprising. Wittgenstein also fought in the Persian Campaign in 1796, in which he was mentioned in many dispatches because of his great honor and uh, courageousness in delivering the keys of the city of Durbent. He married Countess Antonia Cecilia Snarska in 1798, with whom he was to have 11 children with. He was then promoted to Major General in June and went on to command the Mariupol Hussar Regiment in July of 1799. Wittgenstein took part in both the 1805 campaign against Napoleon and in the Russo-Turkish War in 1806. He fought in the battles of Amstetten, Wischau, Austerlitz, earning various decorations along the way. In the War of 1812, Wittgenstein led the right wing of the Russian army during both battles of Polotsk. It was his victories over French Marshal Oudinot that saved the capital of St. Petersburg from being captured. From there, he was known forever as the savior of St. Petersburg. During Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, it was Wittgenstein's army that threatened him from the north. His troops harassed the French as they moved west. Then, at the Battle of the Crossing of the Berezina River, it was said that it was Wittgenstein, not Chichikov, who allowed Napoleon to cross the river due to incompetency. When Kutuzov, the overall military commander of the Russian forces, died, it was Wittgenstein who was given command. Unfortunately, this was a really poor choice made by Alexander I. In the campaigns of 1813, he would lead his men to major losses at the battles of Lutzen and Bautzen. Realizing the overall command was way over his head, he was replaced by Prince Michael Andreas Barclay de Tolly. Instead, he was given command of armies that fought in the battles of Dresden and Leipzig. In 1814, during the battle at bar sur Aub, Wittgenstein was seriously wounded. In 1823, he was promoted to field marshal and led a Russian army against the Turks in 1828, but retired shortly thereafter due to ill health. Peter Wittgenstein died in Lemberg on June 11, 1843, at the age of 74. Next up is the cavalry general Alexander Petrovich Tormasov. Born on August 11, 1752, to a very old, almost ancient, noble Russian family, he would begin his service to the state at the age of 10, serving as a page of honor. When he turned 20, he started as a lieutenant in the Vyatka Infantry Regiment. 
His brilliance was seen almost immediately as he became an aide-de-camp very soon thereafter to Field Marshal Yakov Bruce, who was the hero of the Crimean and Azov campaigns of Peter the Great during the Ottoman Empire, or against the Ottoman Empire, during the Russo-Turkish War. During the Great Northern War, Bruce was involved in the development of Russian artillery. He was commander of artillery in the Battle of Poltava, for which he was awarded the Order of St. Andrew. Tormasov was certainly on the fast track to success being behind a man like Bruce. In 1782, Prince Grigory Potemkin had Tormasov lead forces in the Crimea. Because of his exemplary service during the Russo-Turkish War in 1788-91, through he was promoted to Major General. In the Polish-Russian War of 1792, he served well, especially with Wittgenstein during the Kosciuszko Uprising. Here he was lucky to have served under one of the greatest generals of world history, Alexander Suvorov, who will get his own podcast. Total. An amazing person. Uh, likely due to his time with Potemkin, Emperor Paul I had Tormasov arrested and imprisoned in the Dunamunda fortress. But like everything Paul did, he soon reversed his orders and had the general freed and returned to the army. On the day that Alexander I was coronated, Tormasov was elevated to full general. From here, he served as governor of Kiev, Minsk, and Riga. From 1809 to 1811, he would be made the viceroy of Georgia and commander-in-chief in the Caucasus. When Napoleon invaded Russia, Tormasov led the Third Reserve Army, and he would lead them to the first victory over the French at Kobrin, but would lose the battle at Gorodenshna and the second battle of Krasnoy, which led to his recall by Kutuzov. When Kutuzov died in 1713, Tarmasov was named overall commander of the Russian army. He was not to last long as his health was failing and decided to retire from the field. In 1814, he became the governor or the general governor of Moscow and was charged with rebuilding the city after its destruction by Russian hands and Napoleon's invasion. Within two years, he had succeeded beyond expectations. Three years later, though, on November 13, 1819, he died and was buried in the Donskoy Monastery. His only son died in 1839 and was childless, so the Tomasov family, which had lived in Russia and been nobles for many hundreds of years, ended with him. Well, I hope you liked today's podcast. I know it was a little short, but we are running a little short on time out here, and it was the holidays, so, you know, please excuse me for that. But join me next time when we follow the lives of the three giants of the Napoleonic era, Peter Bagrachon, Mikhail Andreas Barkley de Tolly, and Mikhail Kutuzov. Before we go, I'd like to ask my listeners a favor. Please, if possible, go to my blog site at www.russianrulershistory.com and make a donation to keep the podcast going. Trying to keep things going is getting more and more expensive and harder to sustain. Any amount would be appreciated, small or large. At the site, I'm going to be posting pictures of the generals in the series and links to further information on them, and I'll be doing that tomorrow. Also, don't forget to join us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History page, where you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a message. So now, as always, Das Vidanya Ispasiba Bolshoya.